All right, so that weirdness, so we'll record today's uh, meeting. All right, well, welcome. This is uh, Civil Engineering 3372. The title of the course is Water Systems Design. You are here because you have to be. You probably chose the 8 a.m., not because you're a get up early person, although a few of you might be, but because the one at the preferable 1.30 p.m. was completely full when you registered for the class. So I don't take offense at that. Uh, I'm in the same boat with you. I'm capable of getting here at eight in the morning, but being awake isn't gonna happen for another hour and 20 minutes. Um, so all I really ask of you, don't come in pajamas. You'll put on clothes, clean as dirty as it's fine. And uh, it's okay to bring coffee or drink something to eat. Uh, avoid crunchy stuff because it makes the rest of us hungry. And um, try not to uh, spill in the room because we're actually not supposed to eat and drink in the room. Um, okay, so that's it. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Cleveland. A few of you have met me already. The rest of you by the end of this semester should hate me. Uh, but we'll see if we can get that off uh, going early. So as far as a water systems design is doing, has is, is been, I've worked in the industry, especially the drinking water side, but I haven't done anything in 20 years. So even though I'm trying to keep it current, you can assume that whatever I'm saying is at least 20 years old. And on the drainage side, I've had more recent experience than that. Um, some of what will get presented is probably obsolete in the way that you would do it at an engineering firm, but the background understanding hasn't changed a bit. Water still flows downhill, except in the presence of power and money where you can make it go uphill. So the, uh, all the material is on a web server and you can get to it, not by the URL, but I guess you could get to it by that URL, but it's supposed to be back, uh, cross-connected into Blackboard, and we're gonna go check that right now, once I remember how. So I go to my Firefox deal, add a tab, and Blackboard should be there and auto-authenticate. No, that would be too easy, because that would mean everything's working right. So, Abby, this was your semester right up there. I cannot get it to quit opening up in that one. Um, our class is water systems design. In theory, you shouldn't be able to log into the wrong version of water systems, but after all, it is a computer. And if it can find a way to make your life worse, it will. Um, so here's what our web page, your Blackboard page will look like. There's a video collection, exercises, projects. Those will make more sense in a little bit. The course content link is right up here. And we will see if the syllabus link is working. What are the odds? Anybody a betting person? 50-50 chance it's not going to work. Oh, it did? Did it go to the right place? Sure enough. OK, cool. So that works. So the syllabus part works. So that was a good test. So if you can get to Blackboard, you can get to uh, the material for the class. You'll see there's a notation here that says if you're reading this, then it's not done yet. So in, until that goes away, you can assume that the syllabus will get jacked around a little bit for the first few weeks. Um, to get to the individual lessons, click on the lesson link. And it goes to this, um, online book. So these are my notes. These are the notes I use to uh, create each um, wonderful class meeting. It's actually known as the Redhead Common Gallery, though it's not so red anymore, but it was once. And, uh, this is not a textbook in the usual sense because by uh, university requirement, I have to put the real textbook that's the name of the book. If you go back to Blackboard, 
So we will go back to Blackboard. Right there, there's this Follett Discover thing. If you click on that, first it's going to go verify if it can monetize the connection. It can. The university just got charged three cents. Of that three cents, we get a penny and a half back. And please turn off pop up blockers in your browser to see it. Oh, it's programmed by an idiot. Fair enough. Pop up set tools. That should be security. Pop up, pop up, pop up. There it is. Privacy and security. Ah, this was so much easier before Vladimir Putin tried to steal everybody's info. I do not want to go to the help menu because that's just a waste of time. <laughs> Okay, you win. <laughs> well, normally it would go to a, a collection of pictures. There'll be pictures of three books. Anyone else actually got it working? No, I can't. I tried yesterday. Oh, okay. So it's it's been completely fuck up enabled in the last three days. It's supposed to take you off. Uh, it's supposed to go to a library associated with this class. There'll be a picture of a book. It'll have a dam on it. The title of the book is Hydrology and Water Systems. It's the same one that was used in the hydrology class. Okay, sweet. Um, and that's the book we're supposed to read. Pardon? Okay. So hold it up and, and show it to everybody. So this, this really isn't that hard, but uh, yeah, and it has the picture of the book with the dam on it. You click on that damn book and uh, if you don't, if you don't have it, that's unlikely because if you've had hydrology to get here, you should already have the book. Um, if you don't have the book and you and you're going to choose to buy one to satisfy this class, that one is the second edition. That's a hundred some odd bucks. A first edition will be just fine. The only thing they change is they put some more colorful stuff in it. And they jack the pages around a little bit. Okay, so back to wherever I was. Welcome to Water Systems Design. So. This book here is an electronic textbook. These are my course notes. The left column are the uh, various topics. Um, these, these ones like lesson 18 obviously aren't populated yet, but once the word lesson disappears, it um, actually has some information. Um, from time to time, there's code blocks in it. Those can be copied and pasted into whatever they're supposed to, supposed to do. And that's about uh, it on the introduction to the Jupyter books. You, you're, you guys will not experience these being actually interactive. I'm working on how to make that work. So the whole book is interactive, but not yet. So this is just a book that happens to be online. This sadly is your future because they're going to quit making paper books one of these days because Amazon's found they can make much more money selling digital stuff than actual physical stuff. And by the way, if you buy dental floss on Amazon, read, read it carefully because they're sneaky little bastards. And you're getting a dozen of these floss that you're supposed to get according to the periodontist. Well, they're this big. It's like, it's like single use stuff. So it's totally getting Kroger. It's very annoying. We're gonna get them back. Okay, so this course, 
So out of the uh, catalog as water system design, you're supposed to have taken 3305, which is fluid mechanics. Um, it's okay if you've got a D minus in it, you, you probably got enough out of it, you'd be okay here. And 3354, which is uh, hydrology. Uh, that would be nice if you got a C or better name. And uh, the one and the two apparently are, those are all the footnote things that somehow got captured when I translated to this new format. And the topic of this class is hydraulic analysis and design of municipal water distribution, stormwater collection, and wastewater collection systems. As a practical matter, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about water distribution and stormwater, and we'll, we'll only vaguely hit wastewater right at the end. Uh, frankly, if you can collect stormwater, you can collect wastewater. The hydraulics and technology is essentially the same thing. The only difference is, is the water smells worse if it's wastewater. And you're trying to keep it separate from stormwater. There's some other, there's, but the hydraulics is the same. It's water mostly with some solids in it and solids and stormwater comes from washed off soil and clean roofs and the solids and wastewater comes from your kidney and colons. I guess your kidney doesn't make many solid colons. The general scope will be to uh, examine design guidance documents and use these documents to design uh, various water systems. We're going to do simple ones and in the whole scheme of design, we're not doing detailed design in this class, it'll be conceptual design. So if we want to bring water to a subdivision, how big do the pipes have to be, what pressures have to be at certain locations, and how do we make that happen? Uh, we'll do the same for stormwater collection. We will get exposed to a computer program called EPANET, and we'll get exposed to one called SWIM. I think its current version is five, although that five will change to a six one of these days. Uh, EPA net is a pipeline network modeling program. It's free from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. It has flaws in it, like anything that's free, but it actually is the industry standard. Most of the commercial design programs, civil, 3D, and so forth, actually use its computation engine. Computation engine is pretty mature. Uh, the interface by industrial requirement is crappy. Because they're a federal agency, they're not allowed to compete with private industries, but they need an interface for their own uses. So they cobble something together that works kind of okay. That's what we'll be using. When you leave here and go work at a real company, they're not gonna mess with that crap. You're gonna have a real interface that talks to a database and you go, why didn't we have that in school? And the answer is $40,000 of license. Uh, we'll do the same for SWIM. They're very similar. In fact, the interfaces will look identical enough that it's possible that some of you will use SWIM to try to do EPA net stuff and EPA net to try to do SWIM stuff. It won't work. You send me an email. I did exactly what you did and it doesn't work. And it's like, ah, look at the top. You're using the wrong program. Switch to the right program, everything works great. So let's avoid that email and try to keep your mind in the game on these different computer programs. Uh, we'll also uh, examine the design guidance for wastewater collection, or whether we will actually, <laughs> this should say wastewater, whether we'll actually design a system or not for a future semester. So everybody's worried about a grade because I guess that's something to worry about. So. If there's graded components, it will be comprised of quizzes, homeworks, exams, design report, and design presentation. At some point, you'll have to get together in teams to do the design presentation because like you, I don't wanna hear 39 individual reports on the same thing. I'd rather hear 13 and call it good. Uh, and that's part of the communications intensive part of this class. 
So use that team part wisely. This is the class to determine if you get on a team and the person's a dud. Because when you get to the team design class, you get to write down four or five names, people I can't stand to work with who I'll murder if you assign me to. And they use that to help assign the team. In this class, we'll get them assigned somehow and you don't get that lecture, but don't murder them. Um, you, you, you're too far along to go to uh, Huntsville and wait on an injection. So but use that um, wisely. If you happen to be one of those duds, this would be a good time to quit being a dud and try to become explodable ammunition. So our uh, moving on into water control systems, so now we're actually getting into formal meat of the class. Um, anybody ready to pass out from overheating? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't affect the temperature today, although if it does this next time, we'll, we'll hit it with a sledgehammer and we'll just affect the whole temperature for the building. Uh, all right, well, let's, let's move forward on what water control says. Well, I'm supposed to ask, do y'all have any questions? Cool. That's the one thing I do like about the 8 a.m. class, oh, there was one person with a question. I was non-specific on that. <laughs> uh, we will we'll deal with that at a later uh, meeting, um, but within the next couple of meetings. We don't want to wait until the uh, end of the time. Um, yes, sir. So, yes, I can. We will, we will commit a fire code violation. Somebody on that side of the room, if you want to violate the fire code, stick one of the plastic things in the board and put it in here. I'll violate the fire code on this side. <laughs> Hopefully that will help a little bit. <laughs> okay, so if there is a fire and this room fills with smoke, uh, choose a door and just go out it. <laughs> All right, uh, water control systems. What other safety stuff? If some crazy motherfucker comes in and starts shooting us, there's 39 of us. Attack him or her. Because <laughs> the chance of being able to get all 39 of us is nil. But if we sit here and go, what the heck, then they do have a good chance. So, okay, so that was my act. That was my active shooter briefing. <laughs> and we laugh about it now. If it ever happens. I, I want to be explaining to the president and the district attorney why my 39 people tackled the person and pummeled them. And yeah, okay. All right. Um, so, water control systems are, are, there are two to three ways to classify water systems. Um, first one is water control system. Second one, the water use system, and the last one down there at the bottom, all kind of lonely and wishing it was more important. Environmental restoration system. So water control systems are, are things that we design whose purpose in life is mostly to control surface runoff from rainfall events. It's kind of trying to prevent floods or at least push floods into a neighboring community. Uh, examples of that would be flood control systems, stormwater harvesting, if you have a good market for your stormwater. And the key thing on a water control system is how big they are is usually dependent on the area that they're serving. So if it's serving Harris County, the systems are kind of big. If it's serving, let's see, what's this? Serving Rhode Island, which is probably smaller in Harris County uh, that can be small. Um, these designs are hydrologically dominated. So the hydrology class you've already had and got through and, and are probably thankful you don't have to do that again. <laughs> um, 
um, play a big role in sizing these things. The next category is a water use system. And these are systems primarily designed to keep us alive. Um, so they encompass things like water supply treatment, distribution. In this class, we focus a lot on distribution. And to some extent, wastewater collection, treatment, and eventual discharge. It's after we have taken perfectly yummy water and taken our excretions and put it back into that yummy water, uh, we need to get it back into the environment so we can take it out of the environment again and repeat the cycle. Uh, we don't quite have the South Park episode where we have our mouths tied to the exhaust of the creature in front of us. Good, I can see you with some smiles or something like that. Uh, do you read your end license user agreements now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <I> was, <laughs> they totally did that for the entire uh, viewing public. That was the best public service they did. Um, the capacity of water use system is generally determined by how many people it has to serve. So Lubbock's got 400,000 people right now, maybe a little more. Um, so it, the capacity of its water distribution system is to a large extent based on how do I get water to 400,000 people. Uh, Houston is a couple million, maybe more. Obviously it has, Houston Galveston is 4 million, I'll give you that. Uh, I'm not sure if Houston proper is 4 million. It's a bunch of people. There's a lot of them. There's probably more right now. Oh, two more right now uh, in Houston. And uh, so their water distribution system can be considerably, the size considerably different than Lubbock's one. Not down at the spigot, that's all going to be two inch pipe. But when you get up to the uh, supply end, you, you might have fairly large diameter pipes moving water from point A to point B. Our last category is our lonely environmental restoration system. And these are systems that we design, employ, and manage non-human habitation. So any people like to hunt things that fly in this room? A one duck hunter or goose. Well, those ducks and gooses wouldn't have any place to live if it wasn't for us uh, people who created national wildlife reserves and other things, brought water to them so they could find duck soup, duck food, and put it in the soup. And um, that's an example of environmental restoration system. Building fish ladders so that fishes can get up to the Columbia River and make more fishes so they can go back out to sea so we can have tasting grilled salmon at the restaurant is another example. Um, and, and what we do in those are to create desirable conditions for the fishes or the ducks. And desirability depends upon establishing policy. Once policy is established, we can make a value judgment. So that, that line that shows desirable policy value judgment, the rightmost part of that line is all of us deciding that it's important that there be a few ducks around. The next one, the policy is deciding that our elected, our elected officials in between them being whatever they are most of the time, establish a policy and then we can implement ways to make things desirable for our non-human species friends. So even though that's shown as the lonely one down there at the bottom, there's, it's actually a fairly elaborate uh, design process because unlike the other two, there is a fairly intricate political process that has to happen to make it happen. Now, surely there's politics involved in the drinking water system and the stormwater system, but those are usually pretty easy to achieve. As it turns out, that Congress critters, when they're up to their neck in flood water, are real quick to sign legislation. Yeah, we need to make this flood go somewhere else. Um, not so much when they're out there um, looking at uh, birds. It's like, well, those birds are nice, but do they vote? And so keep that in mind. That was my, uh, my nice 
a political plug right there. Um, let's take a look at a little uh, photo essay tour of some water systems. So this is from a, uh, say a former friend of mine, but he's not dead and I'm not dead. But both of us are trying to get there. Uh, a colleague of mine at the um, University of Alabama, he's been retired for a while. That dude, Dr. Pitt, makes the best mojitos on the planet. Um, his, his hobby is uh, he's looking at stars. So he's got this trailer, it's at least 30 feet long. It shows behind this little piece of crap, uh, small pickup truck, it's full of telescopes. So he drives around taking his telescope and setting it up in parks, making mojitos, and it keeps getting hammered. And if you've had enough mojitos, it's amazing what you can see in those telescopes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you would appreciate me uh, throwing them under a bus like that. So these are most of his pictures. Uh, as we're going to just look at pictures that I'm calling a tour. As we look through, think of each picture, and I'm going to prompt you and say, do you think that's a water control, water use, or environmental restoration system? In some cases, they might be both. You could certainly argue that a, a sewer is both a water control and environmental restoration. Okay, so I hope this works. EDF, here goes nothing. Oh, sweet. Oh, I'm, I'm repressed there. Okay, so here's our first one. We're gonna go. I wish I could do that shell imitation. We're gonna go back to a warm summer evening in Greece. <laughs> in uh, Delphi, where uh, the Oracle um, was sitting there working on their first database. And, uh, in Delphi, Greece, uh, that was the site of Oracle. So back there, Oracle's like financial advisor. You go visit the Oracle, Oracle, you pay them some money and maybe have a, a chicken with them. And then say, okay, so yeah, these Persians have been annoying me. I'm thinking of being in Persia and smoking a little bit. The article says, well, let me check what the gods say. The gods say I need four more pounds of gold before I can give you a useful answer. The oracle gets the gold, stashes her waist. Yeah, go ahead. No problem. They won't even see you coming. And before you know it, you have what we call the 300. So, uh, and that's what it looks like today. I would imagine that in, in the Bronze Age, uh, that there were perhaps buildings there and tents and dancers. You can see uh, what looks to be a rock wall. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that rock wall is recent. Recent in the terms, maybe it's only three or 400 years old. And uh, so this was the spring that produced drinking water for the oracle. So that, that was pretty important back in the day. Where do you get the water? Because they hadn't invented the mighty pipe yet. And the water fountain wasn't to happen for thousands of years. So these springs were pretty important. Water use, water control, environmental restoration. That's a question. Good, that is correct. And then here's uh, the modern springs, which is it took this wall, this wall takes the water that bubbles out of the ground, directs it down to the roadside, and there's a rusty pipe sticking out of that other rock wall. Somebody's filling, filling their clean milk jug with it. It's Delphi Oracle water. Well, let's stay in ancient Greece for a while. And um, in the upper left picture, so we have some storm drain channels in Agora, the Agora, which is a place in Athens in Greece. And on the right side, there's a 288 crossing down in the Houston area. Um, if you look at that left picture, what we see are, are little ditches with rock slabs laid over the top so you can walk across the ditch. And that's so that during a rain, rain event, you don't get your toga wet. So there's nothing worse than a wet toga when you're going to a, a, a Greek uh, festival. 
to spend all the gold that they gave you at the Oracle. Uh, what do you spend it on? They didn't, they didn't have mojitos then, but you get some kind of wine. Uh, so in the photograph, we can see some interesting characteristics. The one on, on, the, on the middle one is probably the best one. So we see these vertical walls. So clearly that ditch has been engineered in some sense. That happens to be a rectangular channel. Of all the geometric figures that you've chosen, that was the worst one to choose. But that was ancient Greece. They hadn't even been at Pythagorean theorems yet. So they did what they knew how to do, vertical walls. And then they put the rock slabs over the top. And using rock slabs as your, as your bridge deck, you have a certain limitation on how wide you can make the channel. Fast forward, see that was 600 BC, 2,600 years, and we got the picture on the right. Other than scale, what's different with the two pictures? Liquid rock that has been allowed to dry. Cars, that's the only difference. Basically, it's the same technology. It's a rock slab laid across a channel that you build for vertical walls. These are slanty vertical walls because that makes the traffic safe. Everyone knows what traffic safe means, right? You could drive off into that ditch and live through the accident. It doesn't mean that the vehicle will continue to run. If it's traffic safe, that would be a six to one side slope. It looks a little steeper than traffic safe to me, but you shouldn't be driving down there anyway. Uh, that's that's just, it's just bad. So again, we have the channel, we have the rock slab over the top, and we have people going back and forth over the rock slab, trying to keep their togas dry. We have a little bit of added bonus features. We have these vertical objects here that let you use longer and longer rocks, or actually multiple rocks together. So if they had invented the drilled shaft back in ancient Greece, you could imagine that this channel would be wider and there'd be the drilled shaft holding up two rocks butted together. Same technology, 2,600 years apart. So I assure you what we learn in this class is at least 2,600 years old. At the other end of the body, after we've had the wine um, and water and goats and chickens with the oracle, eventually it wants its way out. Depending on how well or poorly cooked it is, that might come quickly or it might wait a while. Uh, these, these are pictures from Rome, this one. And you'll notice, you see this, Nice channel here, and there's this, uh, what looks like the uh, uh, floor of an old building. And then we see these rocks here, and they have a rather interesting feature right there you know, with the cursors moving around. That kind of looks like, looks like a toilet seat to me. So does that one. So does this broken one. So does this one. So does this one. And actually, that's pretty cool in Rome because there's enough room between the toilet seats that you can put your drink on while you're doing the thing. You have a place to put your magazine. Oh, they had stone tablets. They hadn't been in paper yet. So their magazines were big old stone tablets. Um, anyone here who's been in uh, military service has probably experienced having to sit in the toilet with at least 50 other people at the same time. It's creepy about the first day. And then after a while, your body says, okay, I can deal with this. It's just like going to prison, except that you don't have guards locking you in at night. So that is a wastewater system. And then they, the toilet stuff, because of mighty gravity, would go down here and actually went into a bucket. And then they had toilet slaves, although I think they called them something else, that would go through that bucket because... Feces was a valuable resource for growing crops. It has a lot of energy still in it. And urine was a valuable resource because you would cook off the water and you left with, with urea, which can be used to set dyes and make your clothes pretty. So most of us are wearing clothes today that have dyes set with urea, except they don't get it that way anymore. They synthesize it at a, at a chemical plant now. Again, thousand year old technology still in use. We moved to Seattle um, a couple hundred years ago. 
and, and I'm, I'm sorry to uh, in, insult the uh, blue staters, but that's pretty much the state-of-the-art bathroom that they get. <laughs> uh, this toilet is elevated because the actual land it's on is slightly below sea level. It's right there uh, near Pike Street, which is very close to the uh, to mean sea level. So they elevated it so that the stuff will go downhill because everybody knows what poop does, right? It goes downhill. So <laughs> you need to be uphill of it. Uh, but that and that are functionally not much different from one another. Again, 2,600 years apart in time. And then the right picture is just my gross one. That's an open sewer somewhere in Serbia. I didn't take the picture of a colleague of mine who was traveling there. It's like, oh, John, that's a really cool picture of a storm sewer. This <laughs> is, it ain't storm water. <laughs> and your face mounted gas chromatograph tells you that pretty quickly. So there are still places in the world today where uh, wastewater is in an open sewer, which is not much different than this channel right here. Uh, with time and with, that, with a little bit of luck in your, in your guys' lifetimes, those will just become a historical, distant, funny memory. So isn't that like water freezing? Yep. So, so in the wintertime, yeah, it's just fine. You, you're, you're, you're ice skating on a little turd slalom. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, at some point in time, around 1000 BC, uh, some brave Greek decided, you know, we could just take those uh, sewers, and pull the sides together at the top, kind of make a hole, and then nobody has to get their togas dirty. And that was the invention of the mighty pipe. Um, being ancient worlds, uh, we don't think so good. So initially they decided they'll just take stone and they'll cut a hole through it and call it a pipe. So here's some pictures of some stone pipes, roughly a thousand BC. And at the time you would be born into a pipe making family. They raise you up to you about old enough to hold a sledgehammer and a chisel. And then you start at your pipe. And by the time you make it to your teen years, you've got your first pipe link done. You start on your second one. Then you die of old age, which is about 24. Uh, and so you've made two pipe lengths. So they're making 40 feet a lifetime of these uh, stone pipes. Um, all that seems slow to the credit, that thing is still in service today. And that's pretty impressive. Uh, then one of the artists of this one family had a pipe cutter and says, I don't want to make pipe. I want to, I want to make clay pots. And said, nope, you're in a pipe making family. So uh, after they got over the initial tears, they came up with the uh, lower left corner. It says, well, I'll just use my clay pot idea. So I'll make these rings and I'll smush them together and then cook the clay. And I got a pipe and I can make hundreds of feet in a lifetime. So we came up, the next one was clay pipes. And vitrified clay is still in use today, although it's, it's slowly fading. Now clay pipe has a nice material advantage in that it's really good uh, in Cost, caustic or corrosive environments. So if you're gonna put dihydrogen oxide, for example, in the pipe, clay would be a good choice. That was a joke, chemistry joke. Nobody got it? Uh -huh. What's the chemical formula for dihydrogen oxide? Yeah, it's, it's dangerous stuff. If you get any of it in your lungs for too long, it kills you. They have, yeah. And the other thing it does is it dissolves anything it touches. So it's it's very deadly substance. We probably should regulate the heck out of it, right? All right, so there's my stone and clay pipe story. The Romans um, did a compromise. They figured out that you can lay, you can put bricks in, into geometric feature, features and you can make pipes out of bricks. And so they would assemble brick pipe assemblies. And here is uh, some ancient Roman pipes somewhere in Rome. That was around 
100 AD, so relatively recent in terms of our little history lesson here. The British, being the way they are, had lead laying all over the place. And they said, this stuff's easy to work with. We'll make our pipes out of lead. And so they did. That's why they're all nutty as fruit cakes, because uh, they have too much uh, lead in their pipe. Lead pipe is still in use today in certain places and applications. And depending on the water chemistry, it can be relatively safe. So lead pipe in and of itself is no big deal unless you have water that's particularly geared towards dissolving the lead and then you drink it, you go nutty. Um, the poor people in London had to deal with cast iron pipe. That's why there's so many poor people left and so few aristocracy left. Because the aristocracy had the lead pipe and the rest of the people had the inferior iron pipe, which was um, biochemically much safer. And we'll go back to Seattle. Um, they kind of went full circle and went back to ancient Crete and decided we'll have pipe families by making holes in perfectly good otherwise objects. But they had an abundance was was wood. So they would cut down trees, make them into squares, and then they would cut a hole in the square. And so you have a round hole in a square pipe. The only society to ever achieve putting a round thing into a square. Yeah. Uh, so they have these wooden pipes uh, fabricated as a picture of one that's shown. And we laugh, a lot of us laugh at wooden pipes, myself included. But there are uh, a couple of really good features of them, assuming you can actually get to them. First is they're phenomenally easy to repair. Because if wood pipe springs a leak in it, what do you do? You take another piece of wood and you pound it into the leak shave it off and it's done. That object's called a bump. What do you think the leak is called? Yeah, I'll let your dirty minds figure out the rest of that. The other advantage of a wooden pipe is once the system's laid out, if you decide you need to do a lateral supply off of it somewhere, all you need to do is make that hole. Drill a hole in it, tap it, and you can extend your pipe system. So. Wood is not such a bad idea, although as you know, as a practical matter today, it wouldn't make much sense because it takes a lot of wood to make a wooden pipe network. And there's not that many trees left. There's a few left in the Amazon, but they should be gone by next week. So uh, there's our history of pipe. Again, we're still spanning several thousand years of history. And fundamental technology hasn't changed much. What has changed? The material that's made out of it. We make pipes today out of, we don't use cast gray iron anymore. We use uh, ductile iron. We use various uh, polymers, concrete, which is basically dried liquid rock, just like if, he, if they had concrete back in the day in, in, uh, in Crete, whatever family had that would have dominated the island. They would go, those, those knuckleheads, they can only produce 40 feet a lifetime. We could produce thousands of feet of lifetime. So who do you think would get all the contracts, the thousands of feet of lifetime people? So mostly what's changed is materials. And that's probably true for most of water systems. Next thing we have to do is water's usually down there, but we want it up here. So we put all our fancy buildings on the top of the hill. Why do you do that? Well, one thing is, yeah, you're right, is so that all that your poop will go downhill into the valley or the holler where the poor folk have to live. More importantly, you can see those poor folk with, poor folk with pitchfork, pitchforks and uh, with flaming torches coming up the hill in enough time that you can hit them with your slingshot or whatever the modern equivalent is of the slingshot. So to lift water, uh, there's a couple of technologies. The, the ones that are not pictured here is the mighty bucket. So you scoop the bucket in the water and you carry it up the hill and you pour it into some sort of storage at the top of the hill. And then you do it again and you do it again. And if this were engineering 1330, what kind of control process would that be? Take the bucket up the hill, do it again, do it again, 
Very good. You got something out of that class. Good job. Um, yeah, you would program that into a do loop and, and that would be how you get water to go uphill. That was very important that we had that conversation because now I can legitimately tell the dean, yes, I downstream concepts from engineering 1330 into the 3000 level class because we're supposed to document that. So if you get asked that question, either tell the truth and say what we just did or just flat out lie and say, oh yeah, man, beat us to death with that crap. So truth or lie is a win for everybody. Uh, the other uh, way to do it is to take those buckets, put them into a circle, and then find some poor sap to walk on the circle and start to rotate the buckets. So as those buckets rotate, they lift water from one elevation to a slightly higher elevation. It runs down the channel. And, and before you know it, you have your, uh, I don't know what you're doing there. It's actually an awful picture. Let's see power lines off to the right. Um, maybe they're growing hashish or something. So there is a pump, which is a collection of buckets or impeller blades, if you will, spinning around. In this case, it's one human power, uh, which is not much different than a large centrifugal pump. Main difference is source of energy, human, electrical electricity, and obviously the scale of the pumps, how fast it can spin. Uh, the other way is to use a slightly different kind of pump. So here's, here's a couple of gentlemen uh, that photograph is probably 7,000 years old, give or take. And they have this uh, screw type object. If you imagine a screw with a sleeve on it, and they're spinning it around and lifting water from one elevation to another. The lower right hand corner is the modern version of that. Those two pictures are roughly 6,000 years apart. Anybody get the fallacy in that last statement? Probably don't have pictures that were 6,000 years ago. When was the photographic process invented? Yeah, very good. Just a little bit before the Civil War. Just in time to be able to get pictures of fields of dead bodies, all eviscerated, laying there, twitching. They didn't have moving pictures yet, so you had to do two of them back to back, and you could hold them, flip them, and see them twitch. So after we pumped our water uphill, we need to store it somewhere. So we could store it in water bottles like a few people that you have in front of you. Go ahead and hold your water bottle. There you go. See, there's a water storage device right there. And uh, we can scale those depending on the knives. <laughs> He's got a big one. Water bottle. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as we're going, through here, uh, there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, one is uh, a big hole in the ground with vertical sidewalls and there's stairs on this end. And that's called a cistern. And there's one right next to it, which would be the brethren. And you would walk down the stairs to go ahead and fetch a pail of water and then go do whatever you're supposed to do with it. Now the purpose of the stairs is, is not as dumb as it seems. Because the water level in the cistern is going to change over the course of the year. It's going to go up and it's going to go down. If you didn't have those stairs, if you just had a vertical wall, when the water goes down, then you have to throw the bucket in with a string and pull it on up. This way you just walk on down and, uh, and do it. Plus it gives them uh, the water carriers a place to go uh, have a smoke where nobody can see them. Once the water goes down, they just go down the stairs, huddle up here in the shade, have a cigarette and go on about their water carrying duties. Because water carriers didn't have a long lifespan, so the least of their worries was the damage that smoking would cause. They were at much greater risk for the nobleman cutting a body part off for fun than they were of smoke inhalation. And then at some point, um, we would put these in these big water bottles, which are basically clay equivalents of what you all have in front of you. They have this lip on the top. And if you look at the size of those water bottles, they're about the size of a fat human being. Um, 
any speculation of why they're not there? Yeah, the, the lips on it, you would tie two, two pieces of timber to it, and then you would have your water carrier volunteers uh, <laughs> pick it up and carry it from one place to another. So there is a certain uh, limitation in size. And then these cisterns, we can get them really big. This is what Lake Mead used to look like back when it had water in it. Um, <laughs> and that's an aerial image. And if you're clever, you can actually approximately date that. So something in the image is missing as compared to if you took that same picture today. Want to think of anyone been there? Don't go to Las Vegas. I mean, I know what happens there. Stay there. This is Golden City, so it's not technically a lot of big issues here. They didn't end up that white tower on the bottom line. It's, it's still there. Oh, it is. Yeah, there's, there's something that's there today that's not in this picture. Yeah, there's a big ass bridge yeah. across the thing. Um, <laughs> It probably was not technical uh, wordage, but it goes it goes somewhere right about here. So I'm speculating you're all in your early 20s. So back when I was your age, you used to be able to ride your bicycle over the top of this thing. So you leave Nevada, and I think Arizona starts right about there. And you go, cool, I'm in Arizona. Now I'm going to ride back to Nevada. You go through two states in one day. The only problem with riding your bicycle here is you just con come down a big hill and you're going, I don't think I want to go back. So you go back to Arizona and then you continue your ride on eastward. Let's go back to these tanks. So if you don't have to move the tanks around, you can scale them up. So here is a picture of them scaled up. These are on the ground and those are made out of uh, concrete segments that have been glued together with concrete aka mortar and then sometimes you want to put them up in the air now there's supposedly the hydrologic hydraulic reason for putting them up in the air is to create a pressure zone it's all bs it's so you can paint the name of your high school football team so i don't know what the nasaraya iraq high school football team is fighting desert fire or something like that and so they need that big one to put the picture of the fire ant and then show them fighting whatever fire ants fight in the uh, in the desert. So we've looked at water storage, tanks, you're welcome, um, lifting water via pumps and transporting water via pipes. That literally hasn't changed in thousands of years. Um, I don't think these are active links. Yeah, they're not. If you want to visit some notable modern, modern being in the sense that they're in use today, uh, big systems. Uh, here's a couple that I think about. Los Angeles Aqueduct, which you're going to get to write a homework assignment. Uh, Central Valley Project. Those are both located in the great state of California where they have those dirty toilets. <laughs> And the Salt River Project is Arizona. Tennessee Valley Authority uh, operates quite a few dams and uh, river system in the Tennessee Valley, referring to the Tennessee River. Uh, they also support art and, and music. Uh, have you seen the movie Deliverance? Tennessee Valley Authority wrote all the music. Anyone seen the movie? Oh, I Yes, I'm losing. It, it's not worth net seeking out on Netflix. If you do happen to have it come around on your uh, viewing thing, I would recommend adult beverages early and often. It'll make the movie better. Uh, the Three Gorges Project, that's um, somewhere in China. And that is actually, that is the definition of it. They took a look at all these big ones and said, yeah, it's pretty big, but we're going to show you what big is. And theirs is so big, it causes earthquakes. Um, somewhat a little closer to home is the Las Vegas Water Authority. Theirs is actually pretty cool. Remember that lake 
mead. I said that what it used to look like when it had water in it. We have a really nice uh, presentation online that shows you how a drop of water from Lake Mead into Las Vegas. Uh, New York has a pretty interesting water supply system because theirs is actually entirely gravity fed. Like California, they said, we don't have any water here, so we'll go upstate and take it from uh, other parts of the state and transport it down. There's one part in the New York system where the water has to drop 110 feet. It doesn't sound like much. So here's a New York solution to that problem. That water's gonna have a lot of energy at the bottom of 110 feet. So we're just gonna put a granite slab down there and replace it every two years. And they've been doing that for a hundred years. They ought to sell that granite slab. Paris has an interesting water system and actually Berlin, uh, Germany has a fairly interesting one. So you, you should take a look at uh, those if you get a chance. So don't all get ready to leave yet. I still got you for 11 more minutes. Okay, did everybody enjoy the uh, photo tour? Yeah. That, that was better than doing actual work, so yeah, I agree. Um, let's talk about the course specific software. Now in 10 minutes, I can't really show you how to install this, but I can describe it. Most of the stuff just works okay. So the two, programs you will eventually need in the course. You certainly don't need them by the end of this week. Uh, but if you um, want to, you might as well get started and getting them installed. One is EPA net, the other one is SWIM. We'll go through EPA net first. So EPA net with the EPA supplied graphical user interface, also known as a GUI, so-called because that's what it feels like when it doesn't work and you can't wash it off, uh, is, is a mostly Windows environment machine and expects the underlying computer to have x86-64, although they may have gotten beyond that by now. So generally that means you need the Intel or AMD based machine. Anybody in here using the Macintosh with an M1 or M2 chip? Do you know if you have the M1 or M2 chip? Is it more than a year old? You don't know? It is more than a year old. So you probably have an uh, Intel chip in it. You would be able to uh, cobble the thing uh, to work. Um, if you have anything with Intel or AMT, AMD based chip, you can get an emulator running and EPA net will work okay. If you happen to have just an ordinary Windows machine, you're, you're probably in great shape. Because for whatever reason the world is anti-Macintosh, anti-ARM. If you have a Chromebook or a Raspberry Pi or a Mac or Macintosh with the uh, ARM chips, you're kind of on your own. The alternative in those cases is just pay 12 bucks a month for Amazon Web Services, get a light sale instance, use the lowest tier. So I think it's $12 a month. That'll get you through the class. It will, it will function. It's not going to be great. Function. Or since you had HEC HMS in your hydrology class, you managed to figure out how to deal with software vaguely. So I think they got theirs working on that. You would take a URL to the installer and then run the installer. So the URL is really easy to find. You go to the Google Tron or the Bing Bong or whatever search engine, you type E P A N E T, hit the return. And looks something like that. And the download is this guy. Or um, let's see, 2020, you probably want to use the latest one. You would download that file and then let it, it's, it's an installer and it'll do its thing. Don't think it comes with the. I think the user manual is a separate file somewhere. So let me see if I can find it. And the user manual is down here. If English isn't good enough for you, but you speak Spanish, you can look at the Spanish manual. 
and that would be EPA net. So I'll let you all struggle with how to do that. Um, there are videos on my YouTube site on, well, actually there are not any installing EPA net on a Windows machine. Oh, that was a bad move, dude. Our other one is SWIM. You will notice that it looks almost identical to the EPA net word except for the SWIM 5 and the SWIM 10. Why do you think that is? Find more place. Same kind of program. Again, it is designed to run on SWIM 64. You can make it run on the other ones. Uh, like this Raspberry Pi or Macintosh. One of these days, the wine emulator will probably work correctly, and then everybody will be happy again. But wine, which is a way of running Windows programs on Macintosh or AMD chips, is a volunteer project by people who volunteer to maintain it, so it doesn't change as fast as commercial stuff does. Download the installer and then run the installer. The way to check the install in either case, so you run the installer, give you an error message. I'll also take the default to the installer and ask you to set the default to the graphical When you get to the end, you try to launch the program. If the interface comes up, you get a picture. Uh, you install the default. The computation engine pretty much works all the time. It's the uh, user interface that tends to break. Uh, that's how you that's how you know that uh, it's installed successfully. Um, if not, you have to uh, uh, debug what's going on. So I have these are obviously notes to myself. If I were going to do that in class, I think I'll show you on um, next time. I'll, I'll fire both of these up so you can see what they look like, and we'll just do a stupid example problem in each one. Um, you don't necessarily need to take notes on that. If you want to read more, um, what you got today came out of these three documents. Let's verify that the links are working. Oh, they are. And Abby, unfortunately, I happen to know your name and who you are. So what is this technique here of where I'm putting these references called? What is the putting the references and the links called? We had a four character acronym for that. CCMR. Copy, cite, modify, run. So <laughs> as you as you steal other people's work, get in the habit of citing where you got it from because we do nothing that has not withstood the test of time. So any creativity you have, someone else had to have it first. I'm kind of being cynical on that, but you need to be in the habit of citing your sources because ultimately you'll all be practicing engineers. You're going to get sued. If you can point to someone else, your loss is a lot less painful. If it points back to you, uh, I hope you have a couple of trailers that they don't know about so you have a place to live after they're done taking the ones that they do know about. I think, I think I'm almost ready to cut you loose. Let me go back to the syllabus and show you about the homework. Oh, the syllabus is directly linked. So in the syllabus, there are uh, homework due dates. And if you click on this one, so next, Tuesday, so you have fun this weekend. You get to um, read and summarize the linked article from 2013, all about the Owens Valley, Los Angeles aqueduct. This is an easy homework assignment. And then you want to produce a two page document and then upload it to Blackboard. There should be an uploader there waiting for you. Um, some of these have easy buttons on them. So if you have no idea how to proceed, hit the easy button. And you can't copy that, but that'll give you a hint. So this is a memorandum from P. N. Gwynn to P. Olar Bear. Um, 
This hasn't even happened yet. It's too new valid on exercise set one. Not everyone has an easy button. Some easy buttons go to a subway job application. <laughs> That's just your instructor's way of saying how much you value you are. It's like you can't figure this out. You're in the wrong place. Uh, that's all for today. Have a great weekend. Try to stay well. Are there any questions as you're leaving? Okay, excellent. So to get to all that, you go via Blackboard. Okay. okay. I would say I actually have damaged this hand and it hurts like that. Oh my god. Is the other hand good? Oh, that one damaged. No, I got it. Yeah, in a different way. Hell.